Hi everyone. Um, this is this session is introduction to Batfish for automated network testing and verification. My name is Mikhail Yeoman. Uh, I'm currently a network automation engineer with Network to Code. I've been automating networks for about three years, um, and I enjoy being part of our uh, network automation community. Uh, there's a lot of cool challenges um, that I see everyone solving with some really cool solutions. Um, so enjoy being part of that. Um, I'm also available on LinkedIn, so after the presentation, uh, you can either DM me or uh, request uh, join to my network, uh, whatever works for you. Um, and just to get started, I wanted to let you all know what we were going to kind of talk about. Um, we want to talk about what Batfish is solving um, within the problem space. Um, I'll give an overview of Batfish, some use cases. Um, quickly go over how it works and then how we can tie all this together using Batfish and a CI CD platform um, such as like Travis CI um, and then I'll give a few cases as to how that's going to look. Um, so if we get started um, let's talk about a little bit about Batfish. Um, it's an open source um, network configuration analysis tool. Uh, the big difference compared to a lot of others is it doesn't connect to devices. So it's not pulling configs off uh, network devices as a whole. Um, what it can do is if you already have like a config generation tool such as Ansible that's already doing it, you can use the configs generated from there um, and use those for Batfish or you can also just use your nightly backups or whatever frequency you have uh, to use. Um, it was originally developed um, by researchers at Microsoft Research, UCLA, and USC. Um, it's also maintained by a company called Intentionet. Um, and they do offer an enterprise uh, version of this, which is um, adds a graphical user interface and then support uh, for it. And then um, to kind of go into what problems is Batfish solving, we kind of want to, what are our existing solutions for testing? Um, right now, um, a lot of people test in production um, just because uh, the cost is cost prohibited, prohibitive to move that, you know, have a mirror of your production in your lab with all the hardware. Um, but maybe you're testing on versions or some hardware related features, layer two features. Um, you could also currently be doing um, virtual network simulation using uh, Cisco Modeling Labs, GNS3 um, of the sorts. But again, those only cover specific aspects. Um, again, you can't model the hardware level stuff in that for the most part. Um, so if we marry all those together and then add Batfish to it, um, we actually get a more complete picture and testing um, of our network. Um, and to kind of go into that, um, some of the use cases we can use for Batfish is uh, validating firewall rules, routing relationships, um, validating some of the flows that uh, are permitted or not, um, configuration compliance. Um, at this point, I really think um, the limitations of Batfish is going to be your imagination. Um, I have some coworkers who have developed some really cool tools using Batfish um, that would have never crossed my mind. So um, again, it, imagination is your only uh, limitation on this. Uh, to kind of go in how it works, um, it's going to require or have a snapshot directory that has some of these subfolders in it that contain our network devicing configs, network device configs, our um, hosts like Linux servers, the IP tables from it. Um, we could also specify layer one topology for data that Batfish can't glean from these configurations. Um, and then it basically parses those configurations into a vendor neutral data model um, and then provides us questions that we can ask to the data it, it gleaned from everything. Um, so it could be questions related to routing, um, et cetera. Um, just as a little preview for uh, Batfish, here's our uh, snapshot layout. Um, we, I have it in the snapshots directory. My snapshot is initial, and then it uh, has some of the configurations that we'll be using for this uh, presentation. 
Another part of this presentation is how you can use it within a uh, CI CD pipeline. Um, and what is that? Um, it is basically allowing you um, to control the quality um, of the code or configs that may be pushed to your network. Um, so it runs this pipeline um, that you get to define. Uh, some of the more common ones that we're probably all familiar with is GitHub uh, Actions, Travis CI, Jenkins, um, and all that. Um, adding this just is really good uh, gatekeeping of the quality um, of changes that go to your network if you're managing it as infrastructure as code. And then you also get to codify these uh, you know, peer review processes. So we're not relying on a human to, okay, let's check these boxes. Um, you know, we're bound to miss something, we're humans and it's just what we do. So if we could automate a lot of this, um, we then can create safer changes to our network. I just kind of want to give a little uh, picture of what our topology looks like just so we can see it. Um, so if we look at it, it's really simple. This is an introduction um, here uh, session, so nothing super complicated. Um, we have our uh, edge device with the BGP neighbor relationship, um, a single firewall, and then an OSPF uh, area zero, uh, almost fully meshed um, for that. So again, it's just straightforward, not many nodes to worry about. And then um, one of the tools I decided to add into this presentation is Ansible. I think a lot of us are already using it in some manner, whether it's backups, um, some config generation, um, and if you have the config generation portion, it should be pretty easy to add Batfish um, and a pipeline into this, uh, into your existing workflow. Um, so with Ansible, we already have the inventory built out. Um, we're storing host variables there already. Uh, so why not just use that um, with the Batfish um, Ansible modules they provide? Um, and then we tie that into our uh, pipeline, whatever flavor that be. Um, it's possible to do that. Um, and we will just take a look at some of the inventory for Ansible. Um, we have our hosts broken down into their roles, um, firewall, core, distribution, and edge. Um, and then within our folder structure, we have some host vars um, that contain you know, our routing protocol information, syslog servers, and our interfaces. Um, and if we kind of take a look at these um, files right now, uh, we could see pretty basic, uh, nothing complicated. Uh, production might be, you're going to have a lot more options for your interfaces. Um, your OSPF or routing protocols is probably going to be a lot more involved, but these are just simple uh, things for our demo. Um, and then config generation, we're using some of those built-in variables again. So we're using our Ansible network OS and then the role that was defined in our host info. Um, and then we're going to output it into our configs directory with the host name um, that it's ran against. And again, the configs portion is the key part right here um, because that's going to fit into the Batfish um, snapshot folder structure it's expecting. Um, here's just a quick look at that. If you see our templates directory, it has our Ansible network OS and then the role. Um, within our template, it's pretty generic. We're not going to be doing too much, um, but we're using Jinja templates to generate those configs. And then our Batfish expected facts. This is going to help us do our config compliance, um, which is one of the use cases we'll be going through. Um, I actually use the um, Batfish extract facts uh, module to get this out and validate it looks good. Um, and then here, you know, it's also an example of this vendor neutral data model that um, I was speaking to earlier. Um, as you can see, we have all sorts of information, uh, DNS, um, IPsec, interfaces, um, routing protocol stuff. Um, so that's what it also uses in the back end as well. Uh, but we're going to use this for our config compliance. And then here's our Travis CI file. Uh, just to put it all together and go through each part, um, we're going to be using Docker um, as we need it for the Batfish service. Um, 
but our before script is kind of telling Travis how to set up this environment so that we can uh, run our tests against it and make sure everything works. Um, so we install pip um, first, we upgrade it, and then we're going to install our requirements. And for this, it's um, Ansible and PyBatfish. And then we're going to install our Batfish role and then start the Batfish container. And then once all that's set up, we're going to go ahead and run our scripts. Um, these could be Python uh, scripts or Ansible scripts in this case. Um, for case number one, that I'm going to show you. Um, didn't want to do these live because they do take time uh, to run, but we're going to use our expected facts. Um, and this is really to just kind of show off, how do I get started with Batfish? Um, well, let's just do simple config compliance, extract our facts, change them around to what we were expecting our network to look like and be configured. Um, NTP, ACLs on interfaces, routing protocols. Um, so I think that's a good place to get started. Um, so if we look at our playbook that we're building out for this, um, we're going to run it against a local host, and then we're going to use that Batfish uh, role that we uh, installed in our pipeline. We then connect to the Batfish server, initialize our snapshot that um, is going to use our configs generated by Ansible. Um, and then we're going to use the validate facts module. And that's basically going to compare the facts they got from our snapshot to the um, expected facts that we uh, created earlier. Um, as I was saying with the Batfish, there are built-in questions that we do get to use here. Um, so we're just going to use those as low-hanging fruit um, to just assert that there's no undefined resources, no routing loops, our uh, routing protocols are compatible with each other, with their neighbors, uh, they come up correctly. Um, so if we run this, we're going to get our CI results back. Um, and as you can see, um, our actual configured logging servers on disk one um, is different than what we expect. Um, we're missing two servers. And um, there is a typo in one of these, uh, 172.16.1.2 .1 should be 2.1. Um, but obviously, those are incorrect anyways. Um, and then on edge one, we actually are expecting an ACL of 110, but we're not seeing one. And then we're also seeing two interfaces that should be disabled. Um, so if we go to fix those now, um, you can see our pull requests and the diff for them. We've added the two logging servers to disk one. And then we've also updated the access list on edge one and then disabled those two interfaces. Um, we generate our configurations again. And uh, we see the configs on the right hand side. We see now, okay, it has the right access list we're expecting and we've shut down those two ports. So if we run it again or push up our changes, wait for the Travis CI to finish, and oh no, we got more errors. Um, as we can see though, um, our validate facts has now passed, but what we're failing on is one of those low hanging fruits uh, questions they have built into it. Um, and if we take a closer look, um, we can see this is on edge one, and there's an access list, uh, 299, that um, it is uh, basically defined on the interface, but it doesn't exist in the global configuration. Um, so after we do our investigation, we determine, hey, this goes to our firewall. Uh, we don't need to block any traffic going to it, so we're actually going to remove the access list, push up our changes, wait for the CI to run, and now we have our results. Um, we are, have a passing uh, merge request or a pull request. Uh, so we could go ahead and merge that in. And now we know our network is at a good spot. Um, our config compliance is passing and as well as our config hygiene. Now we don't have any uh, lingering uh, access list that shouldn't be there or undefined. Um, so if we move on to our second case, um, we're going to go through an access list uh, flow. Um, and this is going to kind of simulate um, working with our security team 
um, trying to break down those silos uh, that we all know. So if we can help enforce some of their policies in our normal checks through our pipeline, um, you know, it helps everyone. We all benefit from it. Um, so for this case, we're going to have a junior network engineer. Uh, they want to hit these web servers remotely and manage them. They're going to open up HTTP and RDP. Um, well, that's against our security policies. We don't allow those open to the world. Um, so we should expect to see this fail. Um, so we'll take a look at this playbook we built to validate um, these requests by the security team. Um, and it's uh, the biggest difference really here to look at is the host is no longer a local host. Um, so it's running against a firewall group. Um, we only have one in it right now, um, but it's going to do some of the same steps as the other one. It's going to connect to Batfish. It's going to upload the snapshot. And then we have a task that is going to validate that HTTP and TCP 3389 is not allowed, which is RDP, um, on the firewalls. If you look at line 31, we're using the inventory hostname variable, which is built into Ansible. It's one of their magic variables. And we're going to assert on the outside access in access list for the firewall. Um, as we add more firewalls to our edge, this will run against all those and substitute that. So we can then guarantee these policies are going to be checked for all our firewalls. Um, and then we have some uh, low-hanging fruit again. Um, just make sure the access list doesn't have anything unreachable. Uh, let's keep up that hygiene. Um, make sure our access list doesn't get uncontrollable. Um, so our network engineer now goes to add the access list. Um, excuse kind of the messiness with this. I cleaned up some of the white space. Uh, but the two in the red box, um, they're permitting um, HTTP and 3389 to our web servers. Um, they push this up and we get our CI results back. And uh-oh, we see that it failed. Um, normally that would be a bad thing, um, but in this case uh, it's denying or it's saying this change would allow uh, protocols that we don't uh, want uh, open up to the world. Um, so it throws the errors. Um, so in this case, it's a good thing. Um, and then the next step for this um, the cool request they opened, um, we're going to close it um, where we can let them know, hey, these aren't uh, allowed. Uh, maybe you should go speak with security, get an exception, um, or just slap their hand and say, no, not allowed. Um, and then on to our third case, um, routing issues. Um, I kind of wanted to cover this uh, since we're all network engineers and everything. Um, so if we look at this um, use case, um, one thing I'll note is we're not going to do another playbook on this. We're going to use our existing ones there. So for this um, possible scenario to happen and be tested, we didn't have to do anything extra to it. Um, but the scenario is a junior network engineer um, was there during an outage over the weekend when Core 2's uplink went down to Core 1, and they want to uh, propose a fix for this. So if we go back to our topology diagram, we can see, okay, um, Core 2's uplink went down to Core 1. It really should fail over since we have OSPF running and all that, um, but the junior engineer is like, well, I've got an idea. I know how to fix it. So what they're going to propose is a static default static route between core two and core three, and then back as well from core three to core two. Um, so let's take a look at their uh, pull request. Um, as we can see, they implement the static routes. Um, the configs go in, uh, the PR is submitted, it's running through the pipeline, and then bam, we, we get an error. Why is that? You know, the junior network engineer is like, ah, oh, this should work. Why isn't it working? Um, and as we can see, this would actually cause a forwarding loop and an outage. Um, we didn't have to do anything extra for this one, right? Uh, the simple one we set up at the beginning uh, playbook, it caught this error as well. Um, so what are we going to do? Uh, we'll close this PR. 
uh, we'll let them know, hey, this would cause an outage. Uh, let's revisit the outage and try and determine the root cause of it and then come up with a non-breaking change, make sure our network um, is still redundant uh, and we don't lose any of that, um, and then fix whatever redundancy issue we had during the outage. Um, so I just want to thank everyone for attending this uh, session. Um, I hope you kind of learn and are excited to start digging into uh, Batfish and all that it offers. Again, this was just a beginning um, session, just a quick intro to it um, and how you can use it. Um, my coworker is going to be uh, doing a presentation um, tomorrow uh, for network high availability, and he goes into some of the deeper stuff there. Um, and then as well, if you have any questions or curious uh, about Batfish, you could go to their website. Um, they have a bunch of information on it. Um, they have links to their own YouTube videos, uh, to blog posts, um, and all sorts of stuff. It's a great, great way to kind of dive into it uh, and see what resources are available for Batfish. Um, you could also join our Network to Code Slack. Um, I think we're above 15,000 members now, so it's a huge community of like-minded individuals. Um, you'll see people uh, solving some really cool issues. Hopefully get to help others out with um, whatever knowledge you bring to the table. Um, we also have a Batfish channel there, so you could always ask questions. The intention that guys are there, um, and they're active as well. And then they also have their own Slack um, that's linked in the slide, or you could go to batfish.org to find out where to go um, to get into their uh, Slack. And uh, yeah. Enjoy your year and thank you very much for attending. <music>